Well, I'm going to be dealing with a healthy pastor and sharing from brokenness to wholeness. And basically what I'm doing this morning is I'm sharing from my life. I'm sharing from my life. Now, you know, for pastors, ministry is a series of good news and bad news. Listen to these scenarios. Good news. You baptized seven people today in the river. Bad news. You lost two of them to the swift current. <laughs> Good news. The women's ministry voted to send you a get well card. Bad news. The vote passed 21 to 20. <laughs> the good news. The deacons accepted your job description the way you wrote it. Bad news. They were so inspired by it, they formed a search committee to find somebody capable of filling the position. <laughs> Good news. Mrs. Jones is wild about your sermons. Bad news. Mrs. Jones is also wild about soap operas, the Wheel of Fortune, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> Pastor Eli, this is for you. The good news, the women's softball team finally won a game. The bad news, they beat your men's softball team. <laughs> the good news, church attendance rose dramatically the last three weeks. The bad news, you were on vacation. <laughs> the good news is your deacons want to send you to the Holy Land. The bad news, they are stalling until the next war. Oh. Now the reality is that in ministry, life is tough. Life is a challenge. There are pressures that we experience that really I can say is at another level because we're not just dealing with the physical challenges that we have to deal with as a result of the emotional traumas and situations that we deal with in life. But also we have an enemy who is set to strike the shepherd in order that the sheep would be scattered. A new pulpit and pew research done in cooperation with Duke University and funded by the Lilly Endowment reports that 60% of pastors say they have never doubted their calling and 70% indicate they have never considered leaving pastoral ministry. Additional survey findings were more pastors don't sense the call until their late 30s. Less than 50% report satisfaction with relationships with other pastors, opportunities for continuing education, salary, and benefits. And even fewer sense overall effectiveness as a leader. Over 70% say a primary problem is reaching people with the gospel. 66% say their congregation has been in conflict in the last two years. And 20% call it significant or major. 10% of respondents said they feel depressed some or most of the time. 40% said they are depressed occasionally or worn out some or most of the time, and 70% said they're carrying too much weight, and 30% of the pastors said they are obese. Pastoring is a challenge. Now, in 1996, the men's group from my church raised monies to send me to the clergy conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And I can tell you that was an amazing conference where I got to be ministered to as a pastor. And it was on the second night of that conference that God dealt with me in a profound way. So much so that when I returned to the hotel room, I began to write what was on my heart. And what I wrote included, I want to be the husband that my wife needs me to be. I want to be the father that my daughters and my son need me to be. Because up to that point, I had struggled and strained and strived.
to be that, but felt I was falling short. And as God spoke during the clergy conference, I felt Him saying, the time is now. And I responded by writing what was in the deepest recesses of my heart. Little did I know that after returning from the clergy conference, after opening up my heart to God, that the following month God would begin open heart surgery in my life. I began that m month of March in 1996 to experience anxiety like I had never known. I began to experience deep depression. And it was there that I called out for help. And then God began to deal with me. And I want to share with you that if we're going to be healthy pastors, we need to address the fault lines that exist in our lives. Addressing the fault lines. According to the, the area of geology, fault in geology means a fault is a planar fracture or discontinuity in volume of rock across which there has been significant displacement. Large faults within the earth's crust result from the action of tectonic forces, energy release associated with rapid movement on active faults is the cause of most earthquakes such as occurs on the San Andreas Fault, California. Notice also a fault line is a surface trace of a fault. The line of intersection between the fault plane and the earth's surface. And I believe that one of the things that keeps pastors and church leaders from experiencing health and wholeness is not dealing with the fault lines that exist in our soul. The Bible speaks of faults. In Psalm 19 verse 12 in the New King James Version, David writes, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Cleanse me from secret faults. The day annotated Bible notes, secret faults refer to those deeply embedded traits that have not come to the surface or manifested themselves in life and conduct, and also to those secret things of life that no one may be conscious of and may be hiding from public view. Here's what I knew. There were things in my soul. There were fault lines in my life that needed to be addressed. But I thought, if only I keep pressing on, they will automatically disappear. And I believe there are leaders in the church that are trying through their work to find healing. But let me tell you something. Working for God does not heal us. Humbling ourselves before God and saying, whatever you want to do to heal me is the starting point. In James 5.16, it says in the King James, confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So the Bible has things to say about faults in our lives. I discovered that the word fault is actually from a Latin word that means deceive. Deceive. Something that mars, defect, or fail. In my life, I was deceived by the deceiver. And I was being held back from becoming healthy as a pastor. And the deception that he was using in my life was twofold. He was saying to me, you can handle this on your own. Just focus on doing more ministry. And if you do more ministry, if you execute yourself more in the work of the Lord, then these issues of your soul will automatically go away. And so I worked harder. I worked with more passion, with more zeal, but I found myself more broken, failing more, falling short more. The second part of his deception was your performance is the means of your acceptance. 
I found myself burnt out. My dad, and I'll never forget this, he was asked by a church leader when he was pastoring, and it was at a time in my life when I wasn't being a good PK. And I remember they were like inside the front door of the church in the foyer and I was outside the steps and, 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 and then the, the leader asked my daddy, yes man, this one, do you think he's going to be a pastor? Piensa usted que va a llegar a ser pastor. My dad responded, thinking I wasn't hearing, ni para diablo no va a llegar. He's not even going to be a deacon. But I know it was his disappointment at what he was seeing played out in his son's life but that stayed in me. And so I worked hard. I'm going to make it. I'm going to be what, what even my dad doesn't think I can become. And the enemy capitalized on that, though, to get me to work harder and not deal with the issues of the soul. But here's the promise of Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17 uh -huh. God says but I will restore you to health and heal your wounds declares the Lord because you are called an outcast Zion for whom no one cares God says I will restore you to health and I will heal your wounds but as Bishop Steve Panay was sharing it is important that we understand it's a process and so, beginning that month of March of 1996, the process began. And these are the things that helped me in the process, and I believe are means of healing. The first was a whatever it takes attitude. I believe if we're going to move from brokenness to wholeness, we have to have a whatever it takes attitude. I have people in my congregation that have come up to me and after an inspiring message, after feeling God convict them towards growth, they'll come and say, Pastor, I'm going to go for it. But it fizzles out in two weeks. Why? Because they haven't come to that point of saying, whatever it takes, I'm going to go for it. I'm reminded of a story that I love to share about this elderly couple that were sitting on the sofa watching television. And since primarily here we are, uh, let's see, yeah, primarily Latinos, they're, we'll call them Pancho and Banchita. And they're sitting there and, and, and Pancho and Banchita are watching one of their favorite programs on TV. And, and, and as they're sitting there, Banchita says to Pancho, Pancho, you remember when you used to hold my hand and we would watch TV? He goes, and a few seconds later, he reaches over and grabs her hand. And then watch a little more. And then Panchita says, But do you remember, Pancho, when you would put your arm around me? He goes, mm. And then a few minutes later, he gets his arm around her. Then she says, And do you remember when he used to move my hair? And bite me on the back of my neck. <laughs> and with that, he gets up, starts walking towards the bed. Panchita says, Where are you going, Pancho? He turns back and says, I'm going to get my key. <laughs> you see, Pancho, if you're going to get the job done, you have to have the right <laughs> The same way, if we're going to move towards healing, we have to have the right attitude. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. And that was the starting point for me. So then what happened was, the next means was counseling. How many of you in enrichment have seen this posted? It's the 1-800 number. I called that number back in 1996. And they connected me with a counseling service in Visalia, California that exists to this day, TMI, Trinity Ministries Incorporated. And I came in contact with Dan Hofer, a licensed counselor. And for the next 10 years, boy, you were
were dysfunctional? Yes, I was. And I'm proud to tell you, I was. But we began to deal with layers. We began to deal with the root causes of what had created that earthquake in my life. Dan Holford said that I was borderline clinically depressed and he was trying to determine, is he going to need medication in this process? Fortunately, it didn't get to that point, but I was right there and I was, I was, I had made up my mind, whatever it takes to be the husband that my wife needs me to be, to be the father that my children need me, I'll pay whatever price. You gotta understand. Counseling services came out of my own pocket. The church didn't pay for it. My insurance didn't cover it. But I was determined to get biblical, godly counseling. And I said, whatever it takes, I'm going to do it. Because my family deserves a healthy father and husband. The next means of healing was the word. The Bible says in Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them. I began to write out scriptures because at night I would have trouble sleeping. The anxiety would return. The depression would emerge. And I couldn't sleep. So I began to write scriptures that talk about that he gives his beloved sleep. And I began to declare over my life the word of God. God, you are my refuge. You're my strength. You're very my very present help in this time of trouble. God, you're my shepherd. I'm not going to lie. God, you're my light. You're my salvation. You're the strength of my life. God, you're my rock. God, According to your word, you said you're going to restore health unto me. You're going to heal me of my wounds. God, I declare your word that in spite of the fact I feel low, I say to my soul, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you disquieted? Of worship. And, and there were times when I would have to honestly say to God, God, 